in 2011, EcoTrust conceived an idea of having sustainable forest management with this particular community. And this is the time when we as researchers came in to see how sustainable forest management, which was geared towards improving local livelihoods, could be used as a pilot in looking at how red could be used in this particular trials. During this time, they were helped, the communities, to begin forming a formal institution, uh, to become a formal institution, where they started uh, getting, uh, you know, very formal and making a constitution, uh, defining what they are all about, and Ecotrust did help this. So they actually had to go through the demarcation of the resource and also trying to get a land title. As I speak today, they have a constitution and I think they are properly registered now. But as we got into this particular community, we we're very interested in looking at their socioeconomic characteristics and most of the households practice subsistence farming. This is farming for mainly household use and the major crops were basically tobacco, rice, and maize, and tobacco being the main cash crop. And this was right as far back as 2011, because 2012, as we speak today, tobacco has been banned in this area, so it's no longer a major commercial activity, which also will have an implication on the red. So clearing of land for cultivation, and extraction of poles for both subsistence and commercial activities were the major drivers of deforestation and forest degradation. <clears throat> Most of our focus group discussions were disaggregated by sex. And this comes from the culture where we come from that the women hardly speak out in the presence of the men. So for you to be able to capture what the women feel and how they relate to some of these aspects, you, need to put, you needed to put them in different groups. Yeah. And this is where it gets interesting because most of the people were clearing forests to be able to have bigger areas for agriculture. The women preferred package five where you had agriculture. The men preferred package three where, we, were not, where did, we did not have agriculture. You name it, there are quite a multiple benefits that we get from marine and coastal ecosystems. Uh, if we look at fisheries alone, uh, particularly in developing countries, uh, they are the major source of food. Uh, in some countries, they are probably the main or the only source of animal protein. Uh, particularly in developing countries, we're talking about as high as 75%, for instance, in places like Sierra Leone or, or, or Senegal. Now, the interesting question to raise is, okay, the government is providing some compensation to this local households, but as we saw earlier, it's a pretty much top-down approach where government is in providing with some amount of rice and alternative income generated activities and some cash. But is that really what the local people want? From our initial findings, uh, what we could find was there was uh, more uh, preference for rice as opposed to cash, obviously, because we're talking about you know, one of some of the most marginalized uh, sections of society in Bangladesh. So rice is a staple food and it's very, very important uh, component for their daily life. So there's very high preference for rice. The other interesting uh, uh, finding that we found in uh, this uh, study is the uh, divergence that we observed between the preference of these fishers and the compensation package that they are uh, provided by the government. A classic example is the, they handed out sewing machines to women-led households. And of course, I mean, they, it was, I mean, they had very positive intention of the government. They wanted to help these women, and so they distribute these sewing machines, but they don't even know how to use these sewing machines. So the obvious reaction was they just sold the sewing machines in the market, and they, I mean, they used the cash for some other purpose. So this shows you know, the inefficiencies in, in, that may cr be created as a result of the divergence between the preference of these communities and what's being provided by the government. There's an obvious uh, sort of inclusion and exclusion error as well, which means that you know, some people that are not meant to be included were being included, uh, and some people who are meant to be part of the scheme are not being included. So there's that sort of front uh, exclusion and inclusion error that needs to be fixed. When you give out rice, rice is the most preferred food for male subjects in, house, in uh, an average household in rural Bangladesh. So when you're giving out rice, that means you're benefiting the men uh, more than the, the women. Women traditionally normally eat in Bangladesh 
uh, atta flor, for instance, which is not uh, highly preferred uh, grain by male subjects in Bangladesh. So that also raised the issue of intra-household uh, distributional issues as opposed to just looking at the between households, which I think is uh, quite interesting. So we need to look beyond the fishermen and look at other uh, segments of the site to whom might be affected by this sort of scheme as we talk about the distributional implications of this kind of schemes. We are um, testing what's so called the conservation auction uh, in one of our uh, watershed in Indonesia. We over a conservation contract to the farmers and then who bids the lowest will be the winner. Yeah, as a, this uh, auction, actually, we want to see uh, how we can allocate the uh, conservation contract more efficiently. And here in, the, in this uh, payment for some services, so we consider the farmers as the land managers. So we consider them as the decision makers yeah, how, on how they, are, they will cultivate, how they will manage their land. And uh, we, we also have uh, some researches in ECRAF. ECRAF stands for the World Agroforestry Center. And um, we also see like, how this agroforest system can provide and maintain the watershed function. If uh, the sedimentation is high, for sure it will give them more, adding uh, more costs in uh, cleaning their filter. Then uh, this is uh, how we, we try to develop our PS uh, mechanism. Well, we hope that by reducing the sedimentation in the upstream area, so the water, uh, the hydropower company can reduce their cost and can save off some of their money as the incentive for farmers for doing good management practices. Actually, it's not that simple, the story in Sumerjaya, because there are many other problems, such as the land conflict, as you see, in that 50% of the area are uh, consisted of the protected forest by the state. And while on the other hand, there are also many migrants coming to this area, particularly from Java. First, for sure, we make, uh, want to make sure that this is a participatory uh, approach, right? So we engage the farmer in determining the hotspots of erosion, what are the problems within the watershed, and also talk with them what type of contract they would like to to see and then what type of solution they provide to reduce sedimentation. So here we would like to bring the local knowledge into the contract as well. It is our area in the color and in green. It is a priority area for the, for the next. <coughs> and it's, it is our buyer for the next. Uh, we have the, still we have the Krakata Tita industry and we have a new buyer for this year's Asaimas Chemical, it's the chemical company and government. <coughs> we need uh, 500 billion per year if we pay 3,000 uh, hectares. But uh, until today, uh, we cannot pay all our area because we have only until 2019, 188,000 US dollars. The major quantity of, of the fishermen in this area are illegal. We don't have all the information together, and it's difficult for the government to make decisions without right information. In this case, in the case of Bangladesh, they have enough knowledge of the chain value of the species. This is very interesting because in our case, we don't have enough information. We know of the market, we know that it's very important for, for our country, um, but we don't, we don't know exactly the number of fishermen or their livelihoods, conditions, or the conditions of the market. In our case, if we compare with the payment for an environmental services program, for the forestry program, now we are competing with other resources in the country, and we need to justify every year, every year, that we need the money for that, because the education program needs money, the, uh, the other parts, infra infrastructure in our country is very important, and that may be one of the main issues right now, and we need to compete with that. Uh, PES or other types of instruments in marine ecosystems is really tricky, because it brings up the big problem of the commons um, up to the front. It's, 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 is huge problem in there, but also monitoring 
which always is our Achilles heel in all of these smallholder projects. So when you go to visit the households, chances are that the responses will be made by um, household heads, who according to that survey would be 82% male. So you wouldn't get the views of, of the female. When you're implementing a project like this, it really calls for adaptive management. So you, you have only principles set in stone. The rest changes um, as, as, as you go along. And for us, it is not a choice-making process, so to speak. You put these permutations and whatever the best gets the highest vote is, is what you apply. It, it, it is a negotiation process. Sustainable agriculture is one of the leading driver of deforestation. So it does not make sense not to support sustainable agriculture. However, sustainable agriculture will not be sustainable if you do not create a market linkage to it. So what, what happens is that the information of, that comes out of the focus group discussions is not about choices, but it, it informs if you're to invest in these, in these um, um, incentives, what are the factors that you need to consider and therefore what would uh, the interventions be. When they are beginning, their needs are very basic. It's, it's about access to water, to food, to building poles. But once they satisfy those needs, then they will grow to the next needs, to the next needs. But also you begin with having very limited resources. So as you design the project, you keep identifying, okay, now we are getting money from carbon payments. Maybe we should access water credits as well. Then donor funding, because the needs are going to be changing and uh, 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 one, one needs to come up with ways of, of uh, enabling the communities to the needs will be changing, but also the opportunities will be changing, and also your understanding of, of, how, of, of what more you can do with, with the communities. Then we realize that actually you can use your carbon agreement as collateral for a loan. So we went into a negotiation with the bank where you, the, the, the farmers can use their carbon agreements as collateral for loans. And it's important of how these PES, this money from carbon, from um, from just cashing into ecosystem services, it's more likely to work if you can understand really how this feeds into existing value chains. So what's the point in trying to add productivity if you can't really capitalize on that because there's no market? When you go into a community as a researcher, you already have your perceived minds of what to expect, but when you get there, it's pretty difficult.